Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians 4.31, and uh, take out the uh, tan insert in your bulletin today. You ever notice how funny some published errors are? You know, I have a collection of bloopers that I've collected through the years from church newsletters. Let me read you a few of them. Uh, here's one I, I always thought was really good, a little frightening, but ushers will eat latecomers. That might help you get here quicker, you know, sooner. Sunday, the pastor will preach his farewell message. Then the choir will sing, break forth into joy. (laughs) Wednesday night, the choir will meet at the Larson house for fun and sinning. (laughs) Tonight's sermon, what is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. (laughs) And I I like this one, too. Weight watchers will meet at 7 p.m. Please use the large double doors at the side entrance. (laughs) You know... And so then the next week, these newsletters will, will, will attempt to make amends. They'll attempt to correct the wrong, and that's what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about trying to correct some of the damage that others have done to us and that we have done to others. We're talking about repairing relationships. Each week during this series, we've been using the acrostic, R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y, recovery, uh, to summarize the eight steps from Jesus' Beatitudes on what we need to do to overcome the hurts, the hang-ups, and the habits that get us down. Step one, if you remember, is realize, R, realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. Step two was E, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him. He cares about me, and that He has the power to help me recover. And then step three was C. Because of that, I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to His care and control. Step four, openly examine my life. Take a look at at my life and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone that I trust. And I pray that you've found somebody that you can trust, that you can share your faults, your, your problems, your issues with. Step five, V, voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask Him to remove my character defects, to knock off the rough edges of my life. And then today we're ready for step six, which is the second E, evaluate all my relationships. Evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me. So you've just got to be able to let go of that past and then make amends to those to. to to those that I have hurt for the harm that I've done them, except, except, notice the exception, when to do so would harm them or others. Look at that scripture. The Bible says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. It's an amazing verse, great verse to memorize. But it's, it's the, the premier verse in the Bible on relationships. There are two parts to this step that we must take if we're going to deal with our hurts and habits and hang-ups. Step one is, I forgive those who've hurt me. I take care of the past. Step two is, I make amends to those I've hurt. So let's take a look at these. Uh, I forgive those who've hurt me. Why do I need to forgive them? There's three reasons you need to forgive other people that have hurt you. Because God has forgiven me. If God has forgiven me, then I should forgive other people. Scripture says, never hold grudges. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. I will never have to forgive anybody as much as God has forgiven me. When you have a hard time forgiving people, it's usually because you don't feel forgiven yourself. People who feel forgiven, who realize what God has forgiven in their lives, don't have much of a problem forgiving others. At least they find it easier to forgive others. People who feel unforgiven find it difficult to forgive others. But when I understand how much God has forgiven me, it makes it a lot easier for me to forgive others. Secondly, I need to forgive others because resentment just doesn't work. God says to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. Resentment is is foolish because it's unreasonable, it's unhealthy, and it's unhelpful. Resentment causes people to do stupid things. You ever watch the Three Stooges? You know, I really kind of enjoy their humor. 
And in one of the one of the episodes, Curly is upset because Larry keeps jamming his finger in his chest. So Curly figures out a way to get even. And Mo comes in and he sees Curly strapping dynamite to his chest. He says, what in the world are you doing? Curly says, Larry keeps jamming his finger in my chest, so I'm putting dynamite under my shirt, and the next time he does that, he's going to blow his finger off. Is that reasonable? See, that's the way resentment works. You always hurt yourself more than the other person. I remember when I used to get mad at Karen 40 years ago. This is how I handle it. I'm going to go out and drink. That'll show her. Who was I hurting? <laughs> Absolutely. It always hurts me more than it does the other person. The Bible says it's foolish to harbor a grudge. It's as irrational as tying dynamite to your chest, you know? But we don't realize that. God says you're only hurting yourself with your anger. When you get angry and upset with somebody, you're stewing and you're fuming, and, and a lot of times it's not bothering them at all because they don't even know it. Buddy Hackett, I always loved Buddy Hackett. He was a great comedian. He said, one time I was watching him on Johnny Carson, he says, I never hold a grudge, Johnny, because while... While you're out grudging, they're out dancing. Doesn't do you any good to hold a grudge. Somebody may have hurt you 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and you're still resentful about it. It's still making you miserable. And they've forgotten all about it. Resentment does not change the past. It cannot correct the problem. It doesn't change the person you're resentful about, and it doesn't hurt them in any way. It only hurts you. It makes you miserable. The unhappiest people I know are the people that go around carrying grudges. The Bible says some people stay healthy until the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Research has shown that the unhealthiest emotion you can have is resentment. It's like a cancer. It just eats you alive. Sometimes we say, well, he's a pain in the neck. And really, that might be the cause of your pain in the neck. The resentment, the bitterness that you're holding. Dr. S.I. McMillan, in, the, in his great book, None of These Diseases, uh, says that two of the greatest problems of physical pro uh, greatest causes of physical problems in your life are guilt and, and resentment. And if people could get rid of guilt, which we can, and we can get rid of resentment, we can, they wouldn't be nearly as unhealthy as they are. See, it's not so much what you eat as it is what eats you that really bothers you that really gets to you. When you're resentful, it just makes you unhealthy physically, emotionally, spiritually. It poisons your whole system. Thinking of that former girlfriend or boyfriend or that former spouse or that teacher who embarrassed you in school, that parent who never told you they love you, that person who broke up with you and never told you why. You hold on to all those things. And you re rehearse those resentments in your mind. And it just prolongs the hurt. It drains your energy. It's emotional suicide. It will kill you. You need to forgive those that hurt you because God has forgiven you. And you need to forgive them because resentment doesn't work. You need to forgive them for your own sake, not for theirs. Third reason you need to forgive is because I need forgiveness in the future. You know what Jesus said? When you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Your resentment blocks the feel, feeling God's forgiveness. By, the Bible says we cannot receive what we're unwilling to give. It, the, the, it's so dangerous to pray the Lord's Prayer. Remember that one, one part of the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts. How's it end? as we forgive the debts of others against us. <laughs> Think about what you're praying. Lord, would you forgive me as much as I forgive others? But Jesus says that's what we're to do. Because God has forgiven us, we're to forgive others. Do you really want him to forgive you the way you forgive others? Forgiveness is a two-way street. One guy came to John Wesley and says, I will never forgive that guy, never. And John Wesley said, then I hope you never sin again. Because you can't receive what you're unwilling to give. Jesus said it so clearly. If you refuse to forgive others, God will not forgive you. 
So we need to forgive so that we can be forgiven. Now, how do I forgive those who've hurt me? First of all, I've got to reveal my hurt. You can't get over your hurt until you admit you've been hurt, like Teresa was talking about. For some reason, we, don't, we often don't want to admit that the people we love have hurt us. Maybe we think that we can't love somebody and be angry with them at the same time. But you can. You do that with your kids all the time. A lady told her counselor, I forgive my parents. They did the best they could. But the more she talked about it, the more the counselor realized she hadn't forgiven her parents. She was still seething inside. She was burning with anger about what they had done. And so when she said, I, I've forgiven them, that's denial. Her parents had made mistakes. They had made bad choices. And some of those things that they had done had really hurt her. My parents did the same thing to me. They really hurt me. You know what? I really did. I did the same thing to my kids. And you did too. We're all screwed up. All of us are. Every parent makes mistakes because we're imperfect. We're fallible. We can't control our tendency to do the wrong thing. And so once we're able to admit, and once this lady was able to admit, the counselor said, no, they didn't always do the right thing. They treated me in ways that was wrong. Then she could begin to forgive them. But you can't forgive what you don't want to own up to. See, you've got three options when you've been hurt. And we've all been hurt. You can repress it, just pretend it doesn't exist. You just ignore it, and that never works. It always pops out in some other form of compulsion or addiction in your life. So you can repress it, but it doesn't work. You can suppress it. You can just say, well, it's no big deal. It really didn't matter. You know, they did the best they could. But it does matter because you're still hurting. It's still bothering you. Or you can confess it. You can just admit it. See, you'll never have closure on your past until you do this. There's no closure without disclosure. You've got to name it. You admit it. That's what confession means. I acknowledge it. I admit it. It was wrong. It hurt me. Don't repress it. Don't suppress it. Just confess it. Now, how do you do that? Well, we talked about that last week, two weeks ago. You make a list on your lifeline. High points, low, li low points of your life all the way back. Is, and, and, and you list those who harmed you. You list what they did, what they said. You, you write it down. Make it very specific. That way you can look at it. It's not just this fuzzy thing in the back of your mind, but it's specific. You think about that teacher that embarrassed you or that, that parent who said you'll never amount to anything. You're, you're going to be a failure all your life. Or you recall that former partner that was unfaithful to you. And then, once you've done that, you can release your offender. You can stop holding on to that hurt. How do you release an offender? Simply by forgiving them. It's the only way you can release them. You don't wait for them to ask for forgiveness. You never do that. Because you're not forgiving them for their sakes. You, you forgive them whether they ask for forgiveness or not because you're doing it for your sake, for God's sake. God has forgiven you, and you're never going to, you're never going to get, have to forgive anybody more than he's forgiven you. And you're going to need forgiveness in the future, right? And God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. So you release your offender. Those feelings of resentment will come back. Forgiveness is not just a one-shot deal where you say, I forgive and you never think about it again. They're going to come back, and every time you feel angry about that memory, you forgive them again. And you just continue to do that. Peter says, well, how often do I have to forgive somebody? And he thought he was being real generous. He said, seven times? And Jesus said, no, seven times, 70 times. In other words, your forgiveness has to be continual. You forgive over and over and over and over again. Every time that hurt comes to mind, you forgive them until you're set free. You know that you have fully released them. When is that? When you can think about that person and it doesn't hurt anymore. You can pray God's blessing on their life. You can begin to understand their hurt rather than focusing on how they hurt you. You see, only hurting people hurt people. And so if you've been hurt, you know that they're hurting. And when you begin to understand their hurt, that's when you 
That's when you've released them. In releasing an offender, it's not always possible. It's not even always advisable for you to go back to them and talk to them about it. See, their circumstances may have changed. Maybe your parents hurt you, but they never knew it. They never realized how they hurt you. And for you to come back to them 20, 30 years later and say, you did this, that just blow them away. They never knew what they did. Now, if they knew what they did, that's a whole other ball game. But some of those folks who hurt you, they've moved away. You don't even know where they are anymore. Some of them have died. What do you do? How can you release those people? How can you forgive those people? You use what I call the empty chair technique. You get a chair like this stool, then you sit down in a chair right beside it, and you just act like you're talking to that person in that chair. And you tell them, you know, I need to say a few things to you. You hurt me very deeply, and here's the way you did it. And you just be specific. You lay it out. But I want you to know that I forgive you because God has forgiven me because resentment doesn't work. I want to let it go and because I want forgiveness in the future. So I'm just, I'm releasing you. I'm forgiving you. I'm letting go of my past. Another way you can do that is to write a letter that you never send. You, you, you put it all out there in black and white. You know, you know, my parents are both dead. I write them a letter. You know, this is how you hurt me. You just unload all the bitterness that you've been carrying, and, and you let it out in that letter. And at the end of that letter, you just say, but starting today, I forgive you. I'm letting go of the past so I can experience freedom in my present. Number three, I replace my hurt with God's peace. The Bible says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. See, a lot of times, our first reaction to forgiving those who hurt you is, well, that's so unfair. If I forgive them, they just get off scot-free. Let let me just tell you, no, they don't. The Bible says one day God is going to call people into account. He's going to balance the books. He's going to have the last word. The Bible says, do not seek your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. God's going to take care of it. He can do a lot better job than you can of settling the score. A lot of times we want to settle the score. We don't want to just give them back what they gave us. We want to twist the sword a little bit, you know. Let God take care of it. The Bible says there's going to be a judgment day. So you just release them. And it allows you to release yourself. You focus on God's peace rather than on trying to get even. Let his peace rule in your hearts. See, relationships can just tear your heart to pieces. But God can glue those pieces back together and cover it with his peace. So let God's peace put the pieces of your life back together. Release those who hurt you so that God can do his repair work in your heart. But now there's a second part to this step. Because in life, not only have people hurt you, but you've hurt other people. Therefore, I make amends to those I've hurt. Why make amends? Because God says, do everything possible on your part to live at peace with everybody. You'll never be able to effectively deal with your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups and your past if you have unresolved relationship issues. The Holy Spirit says if you continue hurting each other and tearing each other apart, you will completely destroy each other. Every unresolved relationship problem has to be dealt with if you're really going to move on with your life, if you're going to become the person that God intends for you to be and enjoy the kind of joy and happiness that he meant for you to have in the first place. So how do I make amends to the people I've hurt? Well, first of all, you've got to make that list of those I've harmed, what I did. You might say, well, I can't think of anybody offhand. Well, let me just ask you a few questions. Think about your spouse, your child. Think about a sibling, an employer, an employee, a friend, a neighbor, a fellow worker, a parent. So think about those people. Is there anyone you owe a debt you haven't repaid? Is there anyone you've broken a promise to that... that, that, uh, you, you failed to keep that, your word. Is there anyone that you're guilty of over-controlling? Is there anyone you're overly possessive of, of, of? Is there anyone you were hypocritical, hypercritical of? You know, just constantly uh, criticizing them. Maybe you've been verbally or physically or emotionally abusive to any of those people. Maybe you've not appreciated them. You've not thanked them for things that they've done in your life. Or maybe you've been unfaithful to them. Maybe you've forgotten a birthday. Maybe you've lied to them. I mean, you can make a list of those that you have harmed. And it's still in your mind. If it's not in your mind, then 
then you don't, you don't have that. But you, you'll think of things. God will bring those things to mind. And then, secondly, think of how you would like others to make amends to you. Jesus said, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. So you stop and think. Now, if somebody was going to come and apologize to me, how would I want them to do it? And that's the way you do it. In making amends or apologizing to others, I think there are three issues you need to look at. Number one is the right time. God says there's a right time and a right way to do everything. So you don't just drop a big bomb on them, you know. You, you kind of ease into it. Uh, you don't do it when they're rushing out the door, you know, when they're heading to an appointment. You know, you, you want to make sure it's good time for them. You don't do it with your wife when she's laying her head down on the pillow, ready to go to sleep. You don't do it in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner with all the family around, you know. You, you look at their time. What's going to be best for them? What's, you know, not just what's best for you, but best for them. And, and you do it with the right attitude. God says, I want you to be speaking the truth in love. So you speak the truth, but you do it in a spirit of love. How would you like somebody to apologize to you? Privately, with humility, sincerity, to simply admit, you know, I did this to you. I know that was wrong. No justification for it. No excuses. No talk about their part. You know, you just, you just talk about your part in it. Just accept responsibility for what you did. Now, most of the time, your friend, your family member, whoever it is, had some part in the problem. You know, the old saying, it takes two to tango. But you're making amends here. And so you're dealing with your part, you know, uh, your side of the ledger. God says, as much as is possible with you. So I call my sister and I say, Cindy, you remember that time when you changed the television channel? from the ball game I was watching, and you made me so mad I hit you over the head with my wiffle ball bat. Well, I'm sorry that you made me that mad. I forgive you. That's not the way to do it. You don't try to justify your actions. You focus only on your part, and then you make restitution where it's possible. You know, if you borrowed something and didn't return it, you return it. If you owe them money, you pay it back. The goal is reconciliation and restoration of the relationship to repair the things you've done wrong, to make amends, and that brings healing and peace and freedom and confidence. There's a great example in the Bible, a guy named Zacchaeus, Luke the 19th chapter, crooked tax collector. He'd made all kinds of money uh, ripping people off, and Jesus came to his home, and he spoke to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus' whole life was changed, changed forever. And after his conversion, he told Jesus, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've overcharged people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus looked at him, and he said, salvation has come to this guy. He's a real believer. He's willing to put his money where his mouth is. He's making restitution wherever it's necessary. You see, that's what God wants us to do. But one thing you should notice, the more serious the offense, the less likely you're, you're going to be, be able to make restitution. There are some things that you've taken away from other people that you can't restore. Their reputation, their dignity, their trust, for example. Don't underestimate the power of a sincere apology. You go to that person with the right time, at the right time, with the right attitude, and you say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I don't deserve your forgiveness, but is there any way I can make amends to you? And if they say, yes, there is, then do that. Otherwise, you just leave it there. But before you ever go to that person, you need to ask yourself, is it appropriate? See, God tells us thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. But wisely spoken words can heal. As I mentioned earlier, there are some situations where it would be unwise to contact the one you hurt. Remember that qualifier? Except when to do so would harm them or others. For example, you wouldn't want to go back to an old girlfriend or an ex-spouse who's now married. Their spouse is an innocent party. You could do more harm than good. See? See? You could make the situation worse. And you don't want to harm them or harm an innocent party. So what do you do? You use that empty chair technique I spoke about or write the letter that you never send. But you do what you can to balance that ledger. Pursue a life that creates peace. 
and builds up our brothers and sisters. The final part of this step, I refocus my life on doing God's will in my relationships. In other words, from this point on, I keep short accounts. See, that's what recovery is all about. I keep short accounts. If I find out that I have hurt someone, immediately I go to them, usually crying because it hurts me that I've hurt someone that I wasn't aware of, and I apologize. I do what I can to make amends. You see, as long as you focus on somebody you resent, you're allowing them to control you. There are people that are allowing their parents who died 20 years ago to still control their life today. Some of you are allowing those people from your past to control your present. And as long as you resent them, they're controlling you. And if you continue to resent them, they will eventually, uh, you'll come to resemble that very person that you resent. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I mentioned that what you focus on is what you become. Now, the good news is that God wants to deal with all this relational garbage in my life. He, he knows, though, what we can handle. And so he takes it off one layer of a time, at a time. When, when, when you became a believer, one layer came off. And, and God wants to keep dealing with you and working with you to release you from all your hurts and habits and hang-ups. So today's another step. Forgive those who have hurt me and make amends to those I've hurt. And God begins to recycle this relational garbage in my life and use it for good. Just like waste management recycles garbage, God wants to recycle the emotional garbage in my life and bring good out of it. How does he do that? Well, the Bible says, put your heart right, reach out to God, then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. Notice the three steps here. Put your heart right. Let go of the past by releasing and forgiving those who have hurt you and by making amends and sincerely apologizing to those that you have hurt. Then reach out to God. Jesus, ask Jesus to give you the power and the strength that you need to forgive others. You cannot manufacture enough forgiveness for all the times that you're going to be hurt in this world. You just don't have it in you. You need to plug into Jesus like we've been talking about so that daily he gives you the ability to forgive. He gives you the forgiveness you need to experience, and as you experience his forgiveness of your sins, he gives you the ability to forgive others, to let go of the past. And then he says, face the world again. You start looking ahead. Your whole perspective has changed. With Christ in you, you've got a new power, a new purpose, a new perspective on life. And notice what happens when you take these three steps. Then all your troubles fade from your memory. That's what I've been talking about. Wouldn't you like to be free from all that relational garbage? That's the whole purpose of step six. On the back of your connection card, look at the next step. Check these steps that you want to take and turn this in. But let's read that step together. Would you read it with me? Evaluate all my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for the harm I've done to others, except when to do so, would harm them or others. That's the first step. Will you do that? Remember that verse that we opened with? Maybe memorize that verse. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Take another step. Make these lists from your lifeline. List all those who have hurt me and what they did. I will list all those I have hurt and what I did, and I will take care of it by taking step six. Or number three, step three, get into Celebrate Recovery. I've, I've heard that Celebrate Recovery has quadrupled uh, over the last few, few, few weeks. Get into Celebrate Recovery, where I will find the support and encouragement to take these steps that will set me free from the bondage of my past. Fill that card out. The guys are going to come down. We're going to sing a couple more songs of worship and praise. The guys will be coming, ushers, guys and gals will be coming to collect those cards. Fill them out. Turn them in in just a few minutes as we sing, uh, or else put them in the uh, boxes at the back, the wall boxes. God bless you.